On today's show, a field of deer hunter dreams might best describe a Minnesota farm called Zumbro Whitetails, where reigns the bone collector. And later, it's all about Minnesota rough grouse, an elusive bird that sometimes acts, well, very, very strange. Like this, see? Next up on Wild in the Kitchen, no need to worry about this year's Thanksgiving dinner. Laura Shera has a wild turkey recipe that's sure to be the hit of the holiday. Mmm, that smells good. Our Minnesota Bound Classic this week goes back to 1940 in one of the darkest days in the history of Minnesota game wardens. Those stories and more next. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. Our first story is all about big whitetail bucks. You know, the kind we all covet. Well, I know where a lot of them are hanging out. Old McDonald never had a farm like this. A field of dreams for deer hunters everywhere. We started in 1998, just a passion for hunting and being around whitetails. Started with a few and then found out that there was uh, an opportunity to make some money doing it. So began Steve Doherty's own dream, Zumbro River Whitetails, a 30-acre farmstead home to more than 100 deer, plus about 60 fawns. How do you keep them down on the farm? So how tall are these fences here? Oh, they're eight feet or 96 inches. That's what the minimum requirement is. You know, we separate them by age and uh, genetics. One thing we uh, try to do is keep our bucks away from our does, especially in the fall. We are considered uh, livestock. Basically, it's no different than cattle farming or anything else. You gotta take care of them. Take care of them means daily farm chores. Oh, aren't they cute? And they're kind of happy to see us. How old are these, Steve? They're born in May. You're about ready to get the boing. I'm out of here. <laughs> you thought you were a coyote. I got about another week about being bottle fed, then I'll be going out. Bottle feeding? <laughs> Who's going to come up, huh? Oh, whoa. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're pulling hard. Yeah, this is good stuff, huh? Cross armed here. Boy, I didn't realize they tug so hard. How often do you have to do this? Once a day, huh? You guys are pros at this. Look at those tails wagging, they're happy. You about done? Huh? Almost. Mama's out of milk. <laughs> Hard to believe these dainty fawns will just in a few months grow up to be mama deer or... If his daddy is this giant buck, will he end up with a giant antlers here? Yep. Giant antlers? Oh yes. That's another crop on this farm, a crop that brings in, pardon the pun, the big bucks. This is a group of two-year-olds. They got a lot of growing left to do yet, but they're getting about halfway done. Bone Collector, yeah. A couple of these bigger ones are some of his offspring. Bone Collector? Okay, who's this Bone Collector buck? So he's the prize bull, so to speak, huh? Yep. This is our main breeder buck. His name is Bone Collector XL. This seemed like the right name because he had a lot of, a lot of antlers on his head. He's a five-year-old this year, and you know, he's going to end up being one of the largest white-tailed deer ever raised. It's pretty much luck. It might never happen again. You can never duplicate them, or they wouldn't. There would be no market for them. That is something else. Whoa. I wonder what those antlers weigh. He's probably a close to a 400-pound deer. Wow, an incredible animal. So do I dare ask, if I had my checkbook here, what would I have to write to buy him? It'd be somewhere in that $250,000 range. <laughs> wow. His offsprings that go to the hunting branches, you know, they bring upwards of anywhere from fifteen dollars to $20,000. Most of those bucks out there are gonna bring that anywhere from probably seven dollars to $10,000 range. What happens to the other deer? Those without giant antlers? We 
offer hunting stock for hunting ranches. We do a lot of breeding. We do a lot of um, meat sales as far as, you know, for venison market. The biggest thing is the breeding as far as the passing on our genetics on to other farms. Steve's passion for deer farming has its roots in his passion for deer hunting. And with the amount of time I spent bow hunting, I've actually gained more respect for him. You realize what it takes for him to survive in the wild. A lot of things have to happen for it to get there. The biggest thing is uh, I don't get buck fever like I used to. <laughs> in recent years, deer farms in the Midwest have been suspected of spreading diseases, such as one called CWD, to wild deer. Doherty says it's not happening on his watch. Every animal that leaves this farm at some point will be tested for CWD. Uh, we TB test and brucellosis test. We are a fully accredited herd. Basically, it's an air gun that we use for uh, darting animals, for medicating. We're the most regulated industry of any livestock. I don't mind the testing because then I know what I've got. We're selling a nice, healthy product and we have no issues. In the meantime, Bone Collector maintains his regal pose down on the farm, his head ornament, the best there is. So when autumn comes and the rut begins, Bone Collector, as well as the other deer, may already know who will win the mating game. When we return, some rough grouse appear to be downright goofy. What's the reason behind it? We don't know. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Minnesota's Select GMC Dealers, Rapala Ice Force, Star Bank, and by Kinetico. Welcome back. You know, lots of folks don't know, but Minnesota is number one in the country in rough grouse populations, a very special forest bird. We have lots of them, but it also turns out we have lots of rough grouse that I would say are kind of goofy. Of all the birds we've known, a woodland bird called the rough grouse, also known as partridge, has left behind the strangest of tales. It all began with this grouse, who had a penchant for chasing lawn tractors. He showed up so often, the folks who owned the lawn named him Rufus. Rufus! She comes up to me most often, because I'm always out here talking to her for half hour, at least half hour time periods. We thought that was the darndest grouse we'd ever met until... Come on, Greg until we met Greg. Greg was a bird that, well, loved to ride an ATV. When Tim first started telling me about this grouse, you know, I didn't even know what a grouse was, and he was like yapping about a grouse, and I'm like, just call him Greg. Come on, let's go. Then there was Rusty. Rusty walked out of the woods one day infatuated with a family from Elk River and their car. He'll literally chase the car down the driveway. Does he think that we're, you know, part of his family or, or what? And before you knew it, he was, he hopped up on my uh, leg. Right, Rusty? Hmm? Like this, see? Now, some folks think it's the drumming sound of engines that makes a perfectly wild grouse come running. Next thing you know, he's right around the four-wheeler, and then all of a sudden he jumped on, jumped up, and, and I just thought, there's nobody who's gonna believe this. Still others who've seen the phenomenon wonder if the bird is a spiritual messenger. I know we have an old friend of ours that just passed away, and, and his name was Monk, and uh, he, uh, you know, I, I says, well, maybe it's Monk coming back. Plus, there's one more theory. Maybe we'll never know. That's a boy. Poor girl. Here. See you later. Be good boy. 
About a quarter cup of fresh sage. Up next, a recipe perfect for the season. Very good. Closed captioning is brought to you by Border View Lodge. Time now to go wild in the kitchen with Laura and Kevin, but you know, it could be anything. At this time of year, venison, pheasant, grouse, quail, fish, I don't know, what's cooking? Tis the season where everybody is thinking turkeys, and I'm getting wild in the kitchen today with Chef Kevin Cavalson from Fire Lake Grill House and Cocktail Bar. And Chef Kevin, we are cooking wild turkey today? We are. Yes. What are we making? Well, this turkey is going to be stuffed with bacon, and it's going to be wrapped with a little bit of bacon as well. Ooh, you said bacon twice. I did. Oh my gosh, can't wait. So what are the first steps of getting started? Well, first we're just going to cut the breast open after it's been in the brine for 48 hours. And then we're just going to make in the thickest part of the turkey breast, we're going to make an incision. And you're just going to create kind of a flap that you can roll back. Okay, Laura, so I've got a little plastic wrap here. And what we're going to do is just lay it on the plastic wrap and then cover it. And then we have to pound it. This is where my job comes in. Yeah. All right, this is what we're using? Mm -hmm. I love it. Yep. You can also use a hammer, but I think this is more fun. No, no, this is good. Oh, okay, I think that's enough, Laura. Whew, I think you okay. can take care of it. All right. Felt good. What's next? So now we're going to make the stuffing. Okay. So go ahead and fill the turkey in the food processor. How much turkey is this? Uh, that is one and a half cups. One and a half cups. All right, Laura, now we're going to put that into our bowl. Stuffing turkey with turkey. Yes. I like that idea. <laughs> we're, going to put, we're going to mix that one cup of the cooked bacon. Cooked bacon, not ground fully. Yeah, you know, just softened, Soft. just enough, because we want some of that fat to render out. Some dried cranberries. That's good. One cup. About a quarter cup of fresh sage. Mm. About a cup of sauteed shallots. Sauteed shallots. Yeah. We can start mixing that. Let's I'm going to keep adding the here. remaining ingredients. So this is torn uh, baguette. Torn baguette. Now is this dried baguette? Is it fresh baguette? Yeah. It can be fresh or dried either way. If it's dried, it's going to take a little bit more moisture. And I have about three tablespoons of heavy cream. I think we're ready to stuff it. Okay. So we can take a little bit of this stuffing. And we're just going to line the center of it. Pretty liberally, because we're going to roll the turkey breast over on itself. And then we're going to just roll it over. Now it's a turkey loaf. Yeah. And then we're going to wrap it with some bacon. OK, Laura. Next, we're going to dump the apples and the yams into the Right into the, the pot? Is this hot at all, or is it nope. still it can room, be room temperature? Temp. Yep. OK. So you're just going to make a little bed, essentially. You don't need to add any extra fat or anything, because the bacon's going to render, essentially, and roast all the vegetables. So how long are we roasting this in the oven? So we're going to cover this and cook it for 425 Fahrenheit for about 30 minutes. How easy is that? Very easy. Then we're going to drop the temp for another 45 to an hour, 325. Mmm, that smells good. Yeah, it sure does. It's time to plate it? Yep. Well, I've been waiting here, letting our turkey rest, so I am ready to dive in. It's been yeah. about 10 minutes. Yep, 10 minutes, we got to let it rest. In that time, we mashed up our yams and apples, gave it a little maple syrup and salt, and it's good to go. We're going to slice this up? Yeah, we're ready to slice. Not only is this going to taste delicious, but it looks beautiful. Oh, thank you. So there you have it, something unique to do for turkey season. Looks great. Going in for a bite. Very good. Coming up, a dark day in the history of Minnesota conservation officers. The year was 1940, and the conflict? Bullhead fishing. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Ellsworth Cooperative Creamery, Radco Truck Accessories, Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. Most of us called them game wardens, conservation officers is the correct name. But way back a long time ago, there was a very dark chapter in the history of our Minnesota game wardens, all over bullheads. We revisit that story in our Minnesota Bound Classic.
In southern Minnesota, the small country town of Waterville claims an undisputed title, fishing capital of the world for bullheads. It's an unusual combination, Waterville and bullheads. Today, bullhead fishing in the lakes around town is a summer tourist attraction. But one day, 65 years ago, catching bullheads became a motive for murder. The year was 1940, and this building, it's been remodeled now, belonged to a commercial fisherman from Waterville, Minnesota. He cleaned his fish here, including bullheads. But on a Friday afternoon, July 12th in 1940, this also became the bloodiest scene in the history of DNR law enforcement. I used to go out fishing by myself, and uh, my father had come down about a certain time in the afternoon. We'd have it set up, and he'd, he'd help me clean the bullheads. But on that afternoon, Lyndon Vale, age 13 at the time, was about to witness a triple murder. I came in that afternoon, and we started cleaning our fish, and the game wardens were here when we came. Three Minnesota game wardens, Marcus Whips, Melvin Holt, and Dudley Brady, had come to see a commercial fisherman by the name of Bryant Bumgartner. They were kind of talking back and forth, and uh, my father could see what was going on, and he said to Brian, he said, we'll leave and we'll come back later. And, and Brian said, they won't bother you people any. Just keep cleaning your fish. You help him clean his fish. They won't bother you any. Bryant Bumgardner was suspected of illegally catching and selling bullheads. The wardens asked to see his commercial fishing license. He said, I will, I will go get them. And to this day, it's, to me, it's, it's just like a Hollywood movie because he walked towards the house back here and those three men walked out of the fish market and went in a circle. Whips went to the right and Holtz stood right up in front of me and Brady was off to my left. When Bryant came out of the house, he was holding this shotgun. And without saying a word, he aimed at the game wardens and opened fire. That was it. It was boom, 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 and they were down. Boom. Warden Marcus Whips, age 45, fell face down in a flower garden. Boom. Hit in the chest. Officer Melvin Holt, 55, dropped in his tracks. Boom. Officer Dudley Brady turned to run, but was hit by the third shot. So you were sitting here. Correct. And after the shots, what did you see? Where, where, where did the game wardens fall? Whips fell over in that area in the flower bed. Uh-huh. And now about this far, Holtz fell right here in front of me. I was this close to him. Okay. Because I felt the pellets and everything going around. Right. Or BBs. And then Brady was over right in this area here and fell there. Without saying a word, the enraged bullhead fisherman reloaded his Remington Model 11 and turned the gun on himself. A picket fence right mm -hmm. in here? Okay. Going this way and a pickup set right in here. Uh-huh. And he, on that side right there, he leaned the shotgun up against the fence. And it was in a matter of four or five seconds and he pulled the trigger and that was it. And four people were dead. Four people had died. That's where my dad said we're going. And uh, I could hear him really moaning and groaning when I went by him. In big headlines and graphic pictures, Waterville and its bullheads made the news. I was eight years old at the time, and I remember dogs howling all over town that night. People had a lot of dogs, but it just seemed, I don't know if the dogs sensed it. I can still remember that part. I couldn't sleep all night. Today, the sleepless nights are gone and the old fish market is now somebody's remodeled home. As for the town's historic murders, well, only a dwindling few remember. I even think about it every once in a while. And Waterville's most infamous bullhead fisherman lies on the edge of town. Sad, sad story all over bullheads, but you know what? Conservation officers have a job to do, and the next time you run into one, tell them thanks, will you? Well, that about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors. I'm Ron Cher, of course, always now, the star of the show who's never been arrested is Raven. Transportation provided by 
Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. To get more Minnesota Bound, including full episodes, go to mnbound.com. And to follow our latest adventures, like us on Facebook. 